Good afternoon. Greetings to this session on uh, extraterrestrial life uh, in the Festival of Ideas. My name is Derek Abbott. I'm based here at Adelaide Uni in the Electrical Engineering Department just here. I'm also Director of the Centre for Biomedical Engineering and it's my pleasure to chair today's session. So I'd like to begin by introducing our speaker, uh, Seth Shostak. A little bit about Seth. He's got a uh, got his BA in Physics from Princeton University in the USA. He then went on and did a, a PhD in Astronomy at Caltech in California, and he now works at the SETI Institute in California. SETI, for those of you who don't know what that stands for, stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Did I get that right? <laughs> um, so they're searching for intelligent life forms out in the out in the universe. Um, SETI is based in Mountain View in California and Seth tells me that's right next door to Google, the people that do the search engines. So Seth's little joke is that there are now two search engines in Mountain View, California. Um, Seth was also, it's not Seth's first time to Adelaide, um, he's been here before. In fact, he was here this, just this last December um, and he went uh, through Adelaide uh, to Roxby Downs to watch the solar, solar eclipse that uh, was this December. And uh, his, the photograph he took of the solar eclipse, uh, eclipse at Roxby Down was uh, actually uh, uh, ran in the New York Times. So uh, the photographer that did the most, uh, got the photograph with the best coverage of Roxby Downs in the world was this guy here. <laughs> so that's one of his claims to fame. Um, also, a, a, another interesting connection he has with Australia is that uh, I don't know how many of you have watched the movie The Dish. For those of you who haven't seen the Australian movie The Dish, I recommend you go out and get the video today. It's about, it's a short, uh, it, it's a film about the Australian radio astronomy dish that is in the parks of Parks Observatory and um, so it's, it's a very famous movie and uh, Seth actually worked there in 1995 for a couple of months so that's, that's another connection he has with, with Australia but uh, I think I want to, I'm dying to hear his uh, talk about extraterrestrials so without further ado can we uh, put our hands together for him You might want to tell them about the baby phone down here. There are all sorts of baby sounds coming out of this speaker. Thank you very much, Derek, for a, a very flattering introduction. In fact, it reminds me of a comment made by Einstein, not that I should compare myself to Einstein, at, at some point, which he said, would it be a shame if the packaging were better than the meat? So, <laughs> anyhow, uh, I'm told that you all have, have to be out of here by 5.30, so the, what I thought I would do <laughs> is uh, talk to you a little bit about why we think the aliens may be out there, how we're looking for them, what they might be like, you know, in case you run across any in downtown Adelaide. And uh, the title of the talk, of course, what it would mean to you, the car buyer, if we were to find them. And then I hope to open this up for questions so you can grill me like a cheese sandwich at the end and ask all those questions you know that I am deliberately not dealing with. Dave's working on the AV here. There you go. All right. Not too bad. I might say, by the way, that uh, uh, although Derek mentioned some of my connection to Australia, I should say that in, in some sense there's a far deeper connection to Australia because I don't know how many of you realize this, but Australia is one of the three or four countries in the forefront of the development of science, the science of radio astronomy. When I was a grad student at Caltech, in fact, the director of the Owens Valley Radio Observatory, was an Australian, Gordon Stanley, but that observatory was actually built by the fellow who built the dish at Parks, John Bolton, another Australian. Uh, the Australians were, uh, as I say, in the forefront of both building new equipment for this science and making the earliest and important scientific discoveries. So you have well reason to be proud of that. Uh, any case, what happens when we find the aliens? All right. Uh, the first question I would ask is, why do we think they're out there? Here you see them waiting for the bus. How, how, many of you, how many of you think that there are aliens out there? I'm just sort of curious, because I, I know what the answer would be in the States, but I don't know here. And how many of you think, well, probably not? 
Okay, well, that's interesting. That's that maybe a fifth of the audience. You're the people I want to talk to later, of course. <laughs> I, if you were to grab the next 10 astronomers off the street of Adelaide, not a good idea, but if you were to do that and ask them, do you think that there might be aliens out there, I suspect 9 out of 10 would say yes. And they would say that not on the basis of personal experience, because there are no personal experiences. Well, there are plenty of personal experiences, but I'm not sure they have anything to do with aliens. We'll get back to that. But <laughs> they would say that on the basis of the fact, fundamentally, that the universe is quite vast. This is a picture of the night sky seen from downtown here during a rolling power blackout. And you can see the pointers and so forth and so on. I mean, obviously, with your eye, you can see several hundred uh, nearby stars. On a, on a clear night with a pair of binoculars, you can see thousands more. All of these stars, of course, are in our galaxy. I think enough of you know some elementary astronomy to be aware that our galaxy is replete with stars. We have on the order of three or four hundred billion stars in our galaxy. And it turns out that roughly one in ten of those is very much like the sun in terms of brightness and size and any other property you care to name. So, you know, we're one of... 40 or 50 billion stars like the sun in our galaxy. That's a big number, and that's not the end of the story, although you may wish that. Uh, this is a photo made by the Hubble Space Telescope about four or five years ago. And it's an unremarkable part of the sky. It's just a bit of the sky near the Big Dipper in the northern hemisphere. And it's actually a very small part of the sky. This is a bit of sky that you could cover up with a pinhead held at arm's length. All they did was expose the camera for you know, about 100 hours or something like that and record very faint stuff. And there, there's some nearby stars here. You can see that spiky thing on the right and the left. Those are nearby stars. But those are the only stars, individual stars, in this picture. Everything else in this photo is a galaxy. Those blobby things are all galaxies, each with several hundred billion stars. And, of course, there are a bunch of big blobs there, but there are also lots of small things here, these little guys, they're, they're galaxies, too. They're just farther away. Now, if you were to take photos like this across the entire sky, something for which the uh, federal budget for NASA is not adequate, but if you were to do that, you would count approximately 100 billion galaxies, each with several hundred billion stars. So, you all being clever people, I'm sure you've multiplied those two numbers together in your head, perhaps on the back of the shirt of the guy in front of you. And that turns out to be a number that's 10,000 billion billion stars in the visible universe. And that, that may be a number that you don't use too often, except at tax time, but in fact, <laughs> that, is, that is more stars visible to our telescopes than there are grains of sand on all the beaches of Australia. Okay. So, for the one out of five of you in here who think, well, this is the only grain of sand where something interesting is happening, you have to say that's an audacious point of view, right? <laughs> That would make you very special. And I know you think you're special, but, you know. All right, well, let's look at this a little bit more carefully. Just because there are literally 10,000 billion billion stars in the, in, in the universe, in the visible universe, there's much more to the universe than what we can see, of course, uh, how many of those stars actually have planets? Because it's not good enough just to have a lot of stars. Life won't cook up on stars. Entirely too toasty. Now, it was thought for many years at least for the last, oh, 30 or 40 years, that every time you made a star, you would have leftover crud, that you would, that's the technical term, that you would turn into planets, okay, as you see in this, this simulation here. But that's theory. And in astronomy, theory doesn't count for very much because astronomy has a very long history of being an observational science. So, you know, the theoreticians are generally ignored. They say, tell me something that I can prove by looking through the telescope. Well, the theoreticians were saying, well, there ought to be a lot of planets out there. And you might think, well, okay, we could easily prove that. We'll just take the Hubble telescope and aim it at some nearby stars and see if there are any planets around them. Good idea, but it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is that planets are dim, kind of like my neighbors, and they're rather close to the stars that they orbit, so they're very difficult to find. They're like trying to find a moth circling a Hollywood searchlight from 10,000 miles away. Very difficult to do. And in fact, no planets had been found as recently as 1995. And then the story changed. It changed because astronomers figured out a way to find the planets without actually seeing them. You see there in the little animation a, a big planet going around a star. And the important thing is that the star doesn't just sit there while the planet you know, <laughs> nicely orbits it in, in some sort of elliptical orbit. The star dances too because of the motion of the planet. Okay. And it turns out that dance of the star is actually 
rather easier to find than the planet itself. And you see behind here some data. They say every time you show a plot like this, you lose 10% of the audience. I, I have 12, so I get well, In any case, <laughs> but what you see here is just plotted the dance of a star by the name of 51 Pegasi, just a nearby star 40 or 50 light years away. And you see it comes at you at about, what, 50 meters a second. That's the speed at which you you know, might drive your BMW down the Hume Highway on your way to Sydney or something for two days, and then it moves away from you at 50 meters per second, then it comes toward you and moves away from you. It's dancing. It's dancing. And it's dancing because there's a planet going around it. So this was the first case in which they found a dancing star implying planets. We now know of something like 110 of these, and every couple of weeks there are a few more. Okay? In fact, the bottom line is that at least 12% of the stars that we look at seem to have planets, one in eight. And the real percentage could be three in eight, or seven in eight, or maybe even eight in eight. We don't know because our instruments aren't adequate to find the, the smaller planets, the ones that are farther out. About a third of these are big guys. They're, they're very big planets, as you see here. A planet maybe the size of Jupiter, very close into its star. Those are the so-called hot Jupiter planets. They're, as I say, they constitute about a third of all that have been found. But it turns out that the instruments used to find these are better at finding those guy, kinds of things. Those aren't the kind of planets ET would like to hang out on, by the way. Those of you who remember any high school physics can work out that the daytime temperatures on a planet like that are around 1,000 degrees. I don't remember whether that's centigrade or Fahrenheit, but when it's 1,000 degrees, what do you care? Uh, so that's, so that, you know, obviously nothing's going to be living there. But where there are big planets, there might be small planets, and you might keep this mission in mind, the Kepler mission. This will be flown by NASA in the year 2007, which lamentably isn't very far off, and that telescope will be able to find small planets, planets the size of the Earth, the size of Mars, maybe even smaller, around other stars. This will be the first and only time in human history where we will do an inventory of the planets, when we will finally find what is the population of planets in the universe. This will all happen within your lifetime, of course. So this is, this is kind, of, kind of interesting stuff. Okay, well, the bottom line of all that is that it seems that planets are not particularly rare. So that's good news. But of course you need more than planets. You need life if you're going to look for ET. And here you have life made out of ping pong balls and sticks. The question is, just because you have a lot of planets, <laughs> a lot of planets cooking up primordial soup, which, by the way, was not a winner for Campbell's. They withdrew this flavor. <laughs> but in any case, you know, how many of them are going to cook up life, right? I mean, Fred Hoyle in Britain said, well, the chances that, you know, you'll cook up DNA just because you've got a planet boiling away on its primordial soup is about the same as the chances that a tornado roaring through a junkyard would assemble a 747. And it turns out that that doesn't happen often. So what he was saying was that, you know, this isn't very likely. Well, not so clear. Uh, we could answer that question in one of two ways. Either we could finally try and under, or we finally could understand how life got started on Earth, something we still don't understand, by the way, but there's a lot of research done into that. If we could finally figure out how life got started on Earth, and it turn, if it were to turn out that that's a process that looks fairly commonplace, then we would expect that life would appear on similar planets elsewhere. The other way to find out whether life is common or not is to look for it. If we could find any kind of life, anywhere else, not necessarily intelligent life, but some sort of pond scum, right, then perhaps that would tell you right away that, that biology is fairly common. Well, the obvious place to look is Mars. People have been looking at Mars for a long time. In fact, this fellow, this is uh, William Herschel, who was the organist at the uh, Octagon Cathedral in Bath a couple of centuries ago, but he turned out to be King George, mad King George's astronomer after he gave up uh, playing the, uh, the organ there. He studied Mars, and he could see that Mars had these polar caps and these dark markings and so forth. He thought that Mars looked a lot like Earth, and he figured there might be Martians. That idea got a lot of credence in the 19th century, particularly thanks to this fellow. And he's probably not so well known here, but this is Percival Lowell. And he was born into a, a, a very wealthy Boston family in the 19th century. He didn't really have to worry about what he was going to do when he grew up, because he didn't have to do anything. But he was interested... He was interested in astronomy, and he went to Harvard, got a degree in, in, in mathematics. He was a very clever guy, actually. He was a very smart guy. And rather than taking a job in a fourth-rate university hoping to get tenure after that, he said, to heck with that. I'll just build my own observatory. We've got the money. So he did. 
uh, he built it in Flagstaff, Arizona, where people told him the atmosphere was nice and stable, so you know, he would have good seeing. And uh, he modestly named this edifice the Lowell Observatory and spent many years using a telescope there to study Mars. And in particular, he claimed that he could see thin straight lines crisscrossing the Martian surface, the canals of Mars. Okay? Now, he believed in these canals till his death in 1916. He mapped about 400 of them. You might wonder, by the way, why the Martians were engaged in all this civil engineering, uh, why, why they didn't invent railroads. I mean, why they, but it, it turns out that Lowell had an answer to that. He said, look, Mars is a dying, drying planet. It's going bad. And the Martians, and he had no doubt there were Martians, the Martians are compelled to dig these canals to bring water from the polar caps down to the equatorial regions where they would grow their Brussels sprouts or whatever else it was that they chowed down on. He wrote this up in a series of books. He was a good writer in addition to everything else, and the public believed it. And so here, <laughs> the baby phone still works. I'm not quite sure what the deal is. Um, of course, in 1900, where was I? It doesn't matter. Uh, it, <laughs> uh, in, in 1900, of course, you would put on a suit and a tie to sit alone all night in a dark dome, you know, looking at Mars. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I say that because of what I've done here. But it, in fact, and, I'm, I, and he, he married rather late in life. He married at the age of 53. Some woman, Constance, she was 14 or something. And he, <laughs> she apparently didn't find this all that interesting, so she remained back in Boston. We don't have any photos of what she was doing in the evening, but presumably not this. Okay, well, <laughs> this would have been astounding if it were true, but it's not true. These were all optical illusions. In fact, this is what Mars really looks like. And when photos like this were shown to Lyndon Johnson, U.S. President, in the 1960s, when NASA first had uh, good photos of Mars, his first reaction was, but where are the canals? Which is kind of a tribute to American science education. Okay, <laughs> there are no canals on Mars, but the interesting and almost ironic fact is that there once was water on the surface of Mars, no doubt about it. This is a, a, a recent photo made of Mars. You see some old craters here, but you see that they have been streamlined, made tear-shaped by the motion of some sort of liquid coming from the upper left to the lower right in this photo here. This is a photo made in the last month or two. Uh, here's another one. You can see sort of a ridge of, of mountains there, again running from upper left to lower right, and places where what looks like a lake or an ocean on the right-hand side broke through Right, and eroded these gullies through there. Okay. So clearly, there was a time when Mars was a kinder, gentler world, and perhaps, indeed, supported life. Well, that idea, of course, gained a lot of notoriety in 1996 when this rock, which has the sexy name ALH84001, it's found in Antarctica, it's a rock about this size, and it comes from Mars. There's no doubt about that. That's not controversial. In fact, there's a little plate on the bottom that says, Made in Mars. So, you know... <laughs> You know, this comes from Mars, on the basis of the composition, for those who really care. Okay. So this, this is a piece of Mars that was kicked off the red planet, you know, 13 million years ago, came to Earth, and we can analyze it. And it has been analyzed, and as you may recall from that big science news story of 1996, it was the biggest science news story of 1996, the claim of some NASA scientists and a guy at Stanford was that inside this rock were Martians, like little Rodney here. The claim is that little Rodney is a Martian, or was a Martian, three and a half billion years ago. He's kind of fossilized now. Now, this would be astoundingly interesting and important. And you might wonder why that would be, because little Rodney, clearly, even if he were alive, would probably not hold up his side of the conversation very well. <laughs> you might think, look, if this is the best Mars can do, I don't need to have any dealings with it. But that's, in fact, rather myopic, because, in fact, if Mars had life, even very simple single-celled life, like you would see in this microscope photo here, that would tell you in an instant that life is not a miracle. Life is just a statistic. Life, biology, is as common as phone poles, right? Because if the next planet out had life, then there's going to be life everywhere. Okay. So this is an important thing to know. Unfortunately, this is very contentious evidence, and most people don't believe that little Rodney here is alive, ever was alive, is a fossil of any sort. So no, the jury's still out on this. But here's another argument that might suge suggest that life is very common. This is a picture of Adelaide made four billion years ago, when it was more of a happening place. Although, <laughs> yeah, I should... I, I should... <laughs> I want to say that the crew here said, be sure to insult the audience, they like that. So, <laughs> I, I, don't, 
<laughs> I don't know why you would like it, but okay. All right, so this is, this is the way the Earth looked four billion years ago when all these leftover rocks were still pummeling all the planets of the solar system. But this stopped about three, those of you who remember the papers, this stopped about 3.8 billion years ago. Okay, yeah, all the rocks were used up. Now the interesting thing is that the oldest fossils that we found, mostly here in Australia, by the way, um, in, up in the, the, the northwest corner, are about 3.6 billion years old. This bombardment stopped at about 3.8 billion years ago. So the point is this. As soon as the Earth became habitable, there was life. Okay? So it didn't take nature very long to produce life, and that suggests that it must be very easy to get started because this experiment didn't take very long. Okay? It's kind of an indirect argument, but I think it's a fairly strong one. So that suggests that biology may not be so hard to find either. So on the basis of admittedly incomplete knowledge, it sounds like, okay, there are a lot of stars, there are a lot of planets, some of those planets will be like Earth with some liquid water, and biology may not be very difficult to get going. Still not good enough for ET, because for ET we require intelligent life. And you may, particularly after this conference, wonder what that is, but for those of us in the SETI biz, there's a very simple definition of what's meant by intelligence. If you can build a radio transmitter, you're intelligent, because then we can detect you, you see. So you should ask the person sitting next to you, hey, can you build a radio transmitter? <laughs> yeah. Judge them accordingly the rest of the weekend. Okay, so, so now the question becomes, okay, just because I give you a few million planets with biology and let them sit there for a few billion years, how many of them are ever going to produce a guy like this, right, who 30,000 years after this photo was taken was building a radio transmitter? And you can tell he's intelligent because he's about to add some RAM to his computer there, I guess. <laughs> all right, now... It turns out that of all the things I say here, this is probably the most contentious issue. Just because you have a lot of biology doesn't mean that you have a lot of intelligence, right? Uh, nature's not interested in intelligence, something you can prove to yourself again by talking to the neighbors. <laughs> Nature is interested only in survival, and intelligence is one mechanism for survival, but there are lots of other cheaper mechanisms for survival, like better eyes and faster legs and stuff like that. So it's unclear that this will happen, but there are, there's reason to think, we don't have really time to go into it, but there's reason to think that intelligence actually might not be uncommon either. We don't know that. Maybe the fastest way to prove it is to find it somewhere else. So, let's discuss that. How could we find the aliens? Here you have a bunch of aliens all looking alike, as they always do, never a sense of humor, no hair. Uh, <laughs> these are kind of your ASA standard or ISO standard aliens these days, <laughs> you little gray guys. But all these are you know, predictions of what we think we are going to become, right? We're losing our hair, these guys, way ahead of us. You know. We're losing our olfactory sense, our dentition. These guys have small noses, small mouths, and uh, big eyes because they sit around designing websites. Okay. <laughs> well, we could try and find them by simply blasting off and going to look. This is what they do every night on television, right? They just call up Scotty down in the engine room, put the pedal to the metal, and away they go. But this doesn't work, as you know, because our rockets are too slow. Our ro rockets go to, like, 10 kilometers a second, which is great if you're going to Cooper Pedy. Unclear why you'd want to, but okay. And, but it's okay if you're going to the moon. It's okay if you're going to Mars. All of that's fine. But if you want to go to the next star, Alpha Centauri, which you can see here in the night sky, it will take you 70,000 years one way. And that's longer than you're going to want to sit there with your tray table and seat back in their fully upright position. You don't want to do that for 70,000 years. You should keep that in mind when you consider the efficacy of attempts to get in touch by gluing greeting cards on the sides of our spacecraft something we've done. I, I won't belabor this because I think you're all familiar with this. This is a plaque that was put on the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft back in the 1970s. What had happened was that somebody realized, somebody at NASA, Eric Burgess was his name, realized that these spacecraft were going to leave the solar system and never come back. So he said, well, let's put a builder's plate on it. And they got Carl Sagan to design this thing. It's about the size of a number, number board on a, on a car. It was engraved in a bowling trophy shop near where I live in <laughs> Mountain View, actually. Uh, but it's fairly clever. The thing on the left is a map of the nearby pulsars up here uh, that, that shows where we are in the galaxy. At the bottom, you see a map of the solar system, Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, spacecraft coming off the Earth. There you see the couple in front of the spacecraft uh, having just stepped out of the shower, I suppose. <laughs> a, friend of mine, a friend of mine at Monash tells me that that upraised hand is the universal symbol of war, but <laughs> it's a little unclear how he knows that, but all right. Now, you know... The, the, the point, however, that this, this is a nice little greeting card, but it's never going to be read because it'll take 70,000 years for this thing to get to the nearest star. It's not aimed at the nearest star. Uh, JPL's figured this out. It'll get within a, a light year, 
of, I think it's Aldebaran, in a million years. It'll all be sanded away by micrometeorites then. It's ridiculous. And it's also ambiguous. I mean, the aliens may pick this up and look at that spiky thing on the left and figure, aha, they look like sea urchins. <laughs> and the thing on the right must be the map. <laughs> That's good fun, but this is like trying to discover America by throwing bottles in the ocean in Spain. It, does, it doesn't work. This is another way to do it. You stand around like these Rockwell engineers and wait for them to land. Now, I have to be... I have to be careful here. Actually, I don't have to be careful here because my plane's this afternoon, so I... But I, I should be a little bit careful because surveys in the United States show that 50% of the population, and this has been true for at least 30 or 40 years now, 50% of the population believes that the aliens are not only out there, but that they're here, occasionally, you know, buzzing the countryside in their saucers or abducting you for salacious experiments. Um, and I, I think that the percentage in Europe and Australia is rather, rather similar. So presumably half of you believe that this is happening. I don't... Um, I'm happy to talk to you about it, but I don't think so. This is probably the best of the UFO photos, and I say that somewhat immodestly because I made this photo in my garage. This is... <laughs> <laughs> this is a lampshade I found in an abandoned shopping cart, but I, I made this for a woman's magazine, actually. The photo editor of the woman's magazine called me up and they said, look, we'd like to buy a UFO photo from you. And I said, well, we don't actually deal with UFOs, but I'll make you a picture. And she said, no, 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 we want a real one. <laughs> I said, well, mine will be as real as any. So I, I made this one, and it's, uh, it's appeared in a lot of magazines, actually. <laughs> it has. Anyhow, this, this is what's purported to be a real UFO. Now, I don't know if this convinces you that aliens are you know, sailing through our skies, or whether it convinces you that perhaps hubcaps are sailing through our <laughs> skies, which would be you know, somewhat less profound. So this is not good enough, this kind of evidence. Clearly, it's not good enough. If you're going to make the claim that, you know, Aliens are here, then you need some decent evidence. This is not it. Nobody ever comes into my office with an ashtray or a radio knob from a UFO. Hey, look at this. Uh, you know, that'd be great. It'd be job security for me. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Uh, this is another bit of evidence often touted as indicating that the aliens are afoot in the land. Namely, they're trying to communicate to the residents of Wiltshire in Hampshire by uh, these crop circles. Aside from the fact that, that humans can make these things uh, overnight with some boards and ropes, and, and routinely do, by the way. You have to ask, I mean, I always wonder about the motivation here. I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to imagine myself, I'm in an alien parliament 100 light years away. Like, okay, Senator Zork, let me understand this bill you have here on the floor. You, you want us to spend 100 trillion galactic cruceros to build this giant spacecraft, go 100 light years to that little yellow star over there, find the blue planet, go down onto that blue planet and carve graffiti in their wheat. Is that it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you'd vote for it. I don't, I don't think they'd vote for it. Now, this doesn't make sense to me. So, bottom line is, we're not going there, certainly not in the foreseeable future, possibly ever. It's very difficult to travel to the stars. That's a really difficult thing. The physics mitigate against that. But, and, and I don't think they've come here. So, any hope? Well, of course there's hope. We could find them at home. We could do what Jodie Foster did here with sometime help of Matthew McConaughey. Although every time they say that, the women all say it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> he was kind of useless, but all right. Uh, it, by eavesdropping on signals, they might be broadcasting into space. Okay? And that's indeed what we do. That movie was based on the work of the SETI Institute. Our current listening program is called Project Phoenix. Just a little bit about it. Here's the antenna that we use to uh, point at nearby stars, hoping to pick up signals they may be broadcasting our way. This is the same one Jodie Foster used in that movie, by the way. It's down in Puerto Rico, Arecibo. I guess that's up in Puerto Rico from your point of view. It's 1,000 feet across. It's the world's largest antenna. It's a very big thing. And any of you who go to Puerto Rico, make sure you, you know, spend the hour and 20 minutes it takes to drive up to it. Go, go check it out. They have a very nice visitor's center, and if you go to the observing room and tell them you know Seth, you know, they'll kick you in the shins or something. Um, <laughs> This is what it looks like underneath. It's, it's a big dish. And by being big, see, it's just one more human endeavor where bigger really is better because it's more sensitive. It can pick up weaker signals. This is a picture I made in April, actually, underneath the dish, showing some of the stars there. But we, we point this thing um, at nearby stars, one after another, and we just check them out, seeing if there are any signals. We listen over a very wide range of the radio dial. For those of you who are propeller heads in the audience, it's the microwave region. We choose the microwave region of the spectrum because that's where the universe is quietest. We know that. 
ET will know that. It only makes sense that if you're trying to get in touch, you'll, you'll broadcast there. That's part of our receiver there behind these, you know, happy-go-lucky engineers that work with us. <laughs> and we, we monitor tens of millions of channels at once. And for each star we look at, we actually check out 2,000 million channels. Okay. Now, how do we know if we've heard something? Easy enough for Jody. She just, <laughs> she just put on some earphones, you know, sat on the hood of her car, waited about 20 seconds, and... And heard something that to me sounded like a pile driver hitting a pod of whales. <laughs> Not that I've ever heard that, but you know. Okay, well, we told Warner Brothers, we were consultants to the film, I remember telling Warner Brothers, I said, this is wrong. You, you, we're monitoring tens of millions of channels. She, she, should be marrying, she should be wearing 10 million pairs of earphones. And the Warner Brothers demurred. They said, we're not going to do that. It'll, it'll crowd the shot. <laughs> <laughs> Mess up her coiffure or something. Okay, so this is what it really looks like. And uh, I apologize again here. This is self-portrait, but you get really bored sitting there. So you start taking pictures of yourself and things like that. So <laughs> but this, this is one of the control, this is the control room that we use at Arecibo. And there you see me pretending to pay attention to the monitors. But you don't actually have to do that because the monitors are paying attention to all these tens of millions of channels. The computers are listening. The computers are listening. And if they find something, they, they make very simple checks to determine whether the signal is truly extraterrestrial or not. We get signals all the time. But that's because we've got this huge antenna monitoring millions of channels, of course. We pick up the, the radar sets down at the airport in San Juan. We pick up telecommunication satellites that are wheeling overhead. You all want your cell phones, particularly in conferences like this. And that means that we have to put up uh, more and more satellites, all of which cause interference. So we have to sort all that out. It's rather difficult, in fact, and becoming more difficult all the time. But that's, that's the name of the game. So this is what it looks like, and that's what we do. Twice a year, we go to Arecibo and we listen. The kind of signal we're looking for, by the way, people often wonder, what are you, what are you listening for? What, what language? We don't care about language. We're only looking for a signal that's clearly made by a transmitter. That's called a narrowband signal. You can see these spiky things. Those are narrowband signals. And in fact, this, I made this picture right off the screen there at Arecibo. It looks pretty good because it looks like, well, by gosh, there are Klingons there in the top pane and some Phrygians down below, whatever. But all of that is terrestrial interference. All that had to be sorted out. So that's what we do. The bottom line is, people ask, how sensitive is this experiment? Well, put it this way. If ET is broadcasting with an antenna as large as the one we're listening with, then we'd be able to hear them from 100 light years if their transmitter power were 10 kilowatts or more. And that's not much. I mean, all the lights in this room are probably close to 10 kilowatts. Okay. And so if you get nothing else out of this talk, which is, of course, eminently possible, uh, maybe you'll, you'll get this. It's very easy to send signals between the stars. It's very hard to send yourself. That's difficult, time-consuming, takes a lot of energy. It's easy to send information, though. It's like having a friend in, in California for you, right? You might occasionally go there, but that's a long trip. It's expensive, it's slow. Sending email is fast, inexpensive, and uh, very energetically cheap. So, whatever else is going on in the galaxy, we assume there's a lot of signaling. Now, have we heard anything? No, not yet. Well, when are we? People often ask, so, uh, Seth, when are you going to find uh, this signal here? You guys have been doing this for a while now, you know. Your mom thinks you ought to get a real job. What about it? <laughs> well, if you ask people who do SETI for a living, hey, uh, Frank Drake here, he's my boss. I always have him in the slides. Uh, <laughs> Frank, when are we going to you know, when are we find the signal? He'll always give you an answer that's the number of years until he retires. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Frank was in, Frank was in uh, Campbelltown, <laughs> what, uh, ten years ago, and he said, we'll find the signal within ten years. He was telling all the ABC reporters, we'll find it within ten years. It's been ten years. Now if you ask him, no, it's still ten years. It's always ten years. Uh, that's not a very good answer. Here's what I think is a better one. How long it's going to take us to find the aliens depends on how many of the aliens there are to find. We're looking for a needle in a haystack. We know how big the haystack is. That's the size of the galaxy. But how many needles are in there? How many civilizations are out there that have their transmitters on that are producing signals that are going right through your bodies as you sit in here? Now, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, Carl Sagan thought that the answer was like a million, a million civilizations in our galaxy. That's the third row here. If Carl were right, then the nearest aliens are on the order of 250 light years away, and we have to sort through 40,000 sun-like stars to find one. Okay? Uh, Frank Drake, as I mentioned, my boss, who came up with this whole idea in a, in a way, he thinks it's more like 10,000 civilizations in the galaxy, in which case the nearest aliens are 1,000 light years away, and we have to sort through, what, 4 million sun-like stars to find one. Now, how many sun-like stars have we actually checked out? 
so far, using the telescope in Puerto Rico and the one in Parks and others in the United States? The answer is four or five hundred stars, only four or five hundred stars. So clearly, we're a long, long way from having reconnoitered enough of this galactic haystack to have any hope of finding a needle. But as it turns out, the experiments keep getting better. This is another one of those 12 plots. But what you see here is the, 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 the quality, if you will, the sensitivity, some, some measure of the goodness of SETI experiments since 1960. And you see they keep getting better. This is an exponential scale, so they're getting better exponentially. Okay, they, in fact, they get better following something called Moore's Law. That's Moore's Law. This applies to computers. And what it says is that the amount of computer computing power you can buy per dollar doubles every 18 months. Now, you're well aware, this is, this, where I live in the Silicon Valley, this is, this is a law of nature. Okay, it's actually an economics law, but it's, it's, it's been translated into a technology law. This is a fact. You know that you have to throw out your computer every three years, and this is the reason why. Moore's Law. Okay? Compute power doubles every 18 months per dollar. And that's been true for 20 years, and it's going to be true for at least another 20 years. Okay. Well, that means SETI doubles every 18 months, too. And we're building a new telescope. It's called the Allen Telescope Array because some of the money to build it was, built, uh, was given to us by Paul Allen, who was the co-founder, along with Bill Gates of the Microsoft Corporation. These are a couple of the antennas up there in Northern California in the, in the Cascades. Uh, I was there a couple of weeks ago. These are, these are big antennas. They're 20 feet across, 6 meters. Uh, and we're going to build, ultimately, 350 of them. Here you see an artist's rendition of what it'll look like. It says, first light, 2005. That depends on the funding. All SETI in the United States is privately funded. Right? And outside the United States, there's very little SETI at all. The only other country that does any substantive, substantive SETI experiment uh, is, is Australia. And they use parks, and it's run out of the University of Western Sydney, Campbelltown. MacArthur. In any case, this is what it will look like when it's completed, as I say, sometime in the next 10 years. And this thing will be a hundred, couple of hundred times faster than what we're doing now, and it'll get faster after that, thanks to Moore's Law. The bottom line is you can compute how many star systems this new telescope will be able to check out as a function of time. And those of you who can see this, see that on this basis, by the year 2015, we will hit ET, if Carl Sagan is right, and by the year, what, 2025 or thereabouts, we will hit ET if Frank Drake is right. So I think that the, the, the bottom line here is that, you know, okay, there are a lot of assumptions here, but this is better than the answer of how many years until I retire. What this is saying is that finding the extraterrestrials is not a project that may take generations. This is not like building a medieval cathedral. This is something that if the assumptions are even moderately, approx moderately correct, this will succeed in your lifetime. Right? This is going to happen in the next two decades. So that's the claim here, and I will bet you all a flat white that it'll take, take place. But I won't bet you more than that, but I'll bet you that. All right, well, let's just... Here's a picture of Parks up there. Let's, let me just briefly describe what would happen if we did hear them. What if we went down to the telescope, and, well, we go back in November to Puerto Rico, and we actually picked up the signal? What happens? <laughs> this is the first thing, supposedly this is the first thing that happened. I had to remove a lot of rotten sandwiches and old fruit and stuff like that <laughs> in order to make this picture. But I have to say, this is the, this is the fridge there, the Arecibo control room, and that champagne is really there. It is there. I have to say that every time we go to the telescope, it's a different bottle of champagne. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, you know, the engineers have caught on to this. But in any case, yeah, all right. Then there would be a big news story. You would read about it. And many of you wonder about that, particularly in the United States. The United States just loves to think that its government is keeping secrets from them, uh, conspiracies and so forth and so on. The Americans love that. And for their part, the U.S. government likes to oblige by occasionally keeping secrets. So <laughs> it's a win-win <laughs> situation. But, but you couldn't keep this secret. We've had false alarms. In 1997, we had a, a, a false alarm that had us convinced for about 16 hours we'd found the aliens. And, you know the New York Times was calling me up and you know, saying, well, what about it, Seth? You, know, you, don't, you don't lie to the New York Times. <laughs> As it turned out, it was a false alarm. But in any case, the media will be all over this right away. So you'll just read about it in the newspapers. But then what? Then what? Well, you would get every telescope in the world aimed at this thing, of course. You would collect all the data you could. You would learn everything you could about whatever star system it's coming from. That would tell you a few things. But what you really want to know is what the aliens are saying. What are they saying, Jim? Well, I don't know. 
Um, and that, that would take a lot of time, probably, because you'd have to build a much larger instrument in order to get the message, the modulation, as it's called. That, that would be much harder to find than finding the signal itself. Okay? And you won't have a Rosetta Stone to decode it either. And, unlike in the movies, the aliens are not going to be at our level. In the movies, they're always at our level. Remember Independence Day, you know, the president asks these aliens, so what do you want us to do? And the alien says, die. Huh. All right. <laughs> I mean, a bit of a downer, but, you know, you've you got you to gotta say that at least it's comprehensible. You know what it is, all right. Well, it's not going to be like that. Any aliens you find, and this isn't to say there aren't stupid aliens out there, but, but any aliens you find are going to be way ahead of you. That's a statistical argument. It's very solid. Way ahead of you. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, maybe more. So, if they've made their transmission easy for you to understand for some altruistic reason, then what are they going to send you? Well, here's all of physics, here's all of astronomy, here's the cure for death, whatever, right? Kind of mess up your life in a way, you know, you've been working away on these research problems <laughs> for 40 years to stack of reprints, and the guy's going to say, you know, really, that's pretty primitive, look at this. You know? <laughs> kind of demoralizing, people have thought about that. But that's one thing that could happen. And I think that's rather unlikely myself. I think it's much more likely that any message we pick up will be totally incomprehensible to us. It would be like giving the output of your computer modem to a Neanderthal. They're never going to figure it out. I mean, the Neanderthals weren't all that stupid, but they're not going to ever figure it out. They don't have the context. So I think that that's much more likely. We're going to get a signal, and there'll be all these bits coming in, and everybody will be putting them on their hard disk and trying to figure them out, like Champignon figured out you know, the, the hieroglyphics. But they never will. And maybe after 100 years, people start worshiping these bits. I don't know what's going to happen. But... But it would still be important. It's, it would, it's kind of analogous to having, um, I don't know, you know, the Incas. You know, they go down to the beach one day and there's this barrel rolled up and there are all these books in the barrel right, some, from some faraway place. They, they don't understand anything about the books. But they know that there's something sophisticated on the other side. And that, I think, would be philosophically very, very important. Okay. Finally, what would they be like? People always want to know. What are the aliens going to look like? Are they going to be little gray guys? In the movies, they're always little gray guys or little green guys or whatever the color du jour is. But they're, and, and they're almost invariably biological. They're always kind of like us, like these guys here from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, right? These little friendly, little friendly aliens, they're about to offer uh, Richard Dreyfuss a joyride in their spacecraft, and they've come hundreds of light years to do this, and at the last minute forgot to get dressed. But it could be, <laughs> could be that Dreyfuss didn't inform them of the dress code, and they were a little unsure. I don't know. Okay. Well, here's, we always assume that the aliens are like that. This is an arrival from the... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is an alien from the movie The Arrival, which, again, you know, he looks pretty much like we do. Obviously, his plastic surgeon is the same one used by Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we are, you know, soft, squishy aliens spawn on a planet, still hanging around on their planet, lots of little identical little guys with no pets, no sense of humor, that kind of thing, all right? Because that's the way we are. But as a system for processing information, which is what we like to think we do, there's a festival of ideas where we process information. Think of this. If you came up with this scheme, I said, okay, I got this information processing idea. What we'll do is we'll have 6 billion 150-pound units, each with little 3-pound processors, called their brains. Not too much interaction but, you know, among these 3-pound these brains. We'll have them all running around. They'll be born dumb. Right? They'll spend the first 20 years of their life getting what's called in the U.S. an education. Then they'll spend the next 40 years doing what's called their day job. And then we'll bury the hard disk, the CPU, in the ground and erase it all. <laughs> Great idea. That sounds good. <laughs> kind of stupid, isn't it? I mean, it's really stupid. Now, the aliens might not stick with that very long. Because, uh, again, well, here's more things that we always assume. Right? There we are. Anthropomorphic aliens. We assume that because we figure they look like us. Right? If, the, if the dinosaurs had thought about aliens, they probably would have figured the, the aliens look like dinosaurs. But this ignores what we're doing. Here's a picture of my family tree, not terribly interesting. But the, the, the interesting thing is actually what's on the right. Where are we going? Not something you think about very much. You probably don't wake up in the middle of the night. Marge, who's going to be running the planet a million years from now? You know, you think about that. I said that uh, yesterday, I think. It could very well be that we're only here to invent our successors, namely the machines. We don't have thinking machines now. Everybody knows that. But that may not stay so for very long. It may be that we can, in fact, build a machine that not only can do spreadsheets and word processing and all that stuff, but that can actually think, that can get up, stand up and tell you jokes, that can write poetry, 
right, that can teach physics, that can do all the things that humans do. And the point there is that if we ever invent that machine, it will evolve very quickly because it isn't stuck, as you are, with Darwinian evolution. It doesn't have to wait a thousand generations if it wants more memory. Right? If you want more memory, you have you know, not much you can do about it. The machine, you just go down to, you know, <laughs> to the local electronics store and buy it and put it in. You can improve yourself as an individual. The machines are following Moore's law. Darwinian evolution is not, not doing that. In fact, humans are probably not getting smarter. You know, you got three-pound brains. It'd be great if we had five-pound brains, but women have voted not to do this. They have difficulty enough giving birth to kids that are going to have three-pound brains. So they're, they're, they're fundamental bottlenecks, if you will. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Sorry I said that. Okay, well... But, but my point here is actually a serious one. This is, this is a, <laughs> you probably don't believe that, but this is a plot made by Hans Morvek at uh, Carnegie Mellon Institution. And again, this date on the, the bottom here, going from 1900 up to the present, and what's plotted vertically is the speed of our fastest computers. This is, again, a logarithmic plot. And you can see that the fastest computers, when this plot was made in 1998, had about the computational capability of a spider or a bug or something like that. But the point is that by the year 2020, this is for sure, by the year 2020, your desktop machine, the one you just buy you know, at the local consumer outlet, will have more computational capability and more memory than the person sitting next to you in this room. Okay? And after that, it just keeps getting, keep getting bigger. So that isn't to say that they can think, but they might be able to think. So my bottom line here is that if we develop artificial intelligence, presumably some other civilization has already done that. Right? We're not the first kids on the block. The Earth was formed four and a half billion years ago. The galaxy was formed something like 12 billion years ago. Right? So there's been plenty of time for this whole scenario to have played out elsewhere. So I guess what I'm trying to say is this. If we pick up a signal, I don't think any of you will be surprised to learn that that signal comes from a machine, namely a transmitter but I'm suggesting to you that you should be prepared for the very real possibility that that machine is simply in the service of another machine and that biological intelligence, the kind that we have and that we assume that they have, might only be a cheap motel on the way to the real intelligence of the universe, which is all artificial. Robert Hughes uh, wrote about, and you all know this, wrote about these fatal shores, and he mentioned how in the late 18th century when Jim Cook sailed into Botany Bay, he shattered a watch glass that had hung over this continent for 40,000 years. Well, I think in the next 20 years, it's very likely that we will do the same for the whole planet. A watch glass has sat over Earth for four and a half billion years, and I think you're going to be the generation that breaks it. Thank you very much. Okay, we have some time for some questions now uh, from the audience. Uh, now, I've been told there are a couple of microphones uh, in the alleyways. I can't see any. Um, oh, oh, there it is, yes. And I believe there's one up in the gallery in the corner. So if anyone has any questions, I'd like you to walk up to the microphone and uh, uh, say your question, please. Uh, while we're waiting for people to do that, I might just uh, throw out a quick question to w get things warmed up. So, um, Seth, uh, it seems to me that it doesn't stretch my imagination too much to believe there's probably some bacteria in other planets in the universe, but to think that there might be intelligent life, intelligent enough to generate a, a radio transmitter, I find that very hard to believe. And um, my argument against it is uh, simply that to, to get to that level of organization and civilization to do that requires many coincidences all in a row. Uh, for, just to give you one particular example, um, on Earth we happen to have trees that give you rubber, okay? And from that rubber we make tires for cars and that helps our civilization because we can build trucks and get organized and all that sort of thing. So if one of these stars has potential intelligent life but doesn't have a tree with rubber, you're stuffed. <laughs> uh, and, that's only, and that's only rubber. So what, what about all the other things? So what would be your answer to that? Well, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, I, I think that the, the rubber argument is a bit of a stretch. But I, 
<laughs> but, but, but it is a good question. I mean, let me give you another example to, to, to support your point of view. You all remember that 65 million years ago, the dinos were wiped out by a rock that wiped out something like three quarters of all species. And had that rock arrived in the Yucatan 20 minutes earlier, it would have missed the Earth, and you wouldn't be sitting through this, right? There would be dinosaurs in Adelaide. And, and now you might say, oh, well, but the, the, dinosaur, the, the counter-argument to be, that would have been, oh, yes, okay, sure, but we would still be sitting through, we'd still be suffering through this because the, the dinosaurs would have gotten smart and the, the chairs would have holes in the back so we could get our tails through, but otherwise it would be the same. <laughs> but that's not at all clear. It's not at all clear. In fact, I asked an evolutionary biologist that very question. I said, suppose the dinos hadn't been wiped out, would they have gotten smart? And he said to me, well, look, Seth, the dinos had 150 million years to get smart and didn't. What would another 65 million years have done for them? Okay. So it's unclear, but, but it is true that there's, there's a line of research, actually. There's, there's several people who are worried about this very question who look at other species to find out, have any other species increased in intelligence in the last, say, 50 million years? And it turns out quite a few have. It seems that intelligence is worthwhile to nature for certain kinds of critters, social critters. You know, think of you know, dolphins and whales, of course, and obviously chimps, other primates, also certain kinds of birds and so forth. All of these are relatively more, you know, a lot more intelligent than any of the dinos were, right? So there's been a trend toward intelligence over a range of species, suggesting that, that intelligence is something that nature will stumble into more frequently than you might expect. The other thing, and I mentioned this yesterday about how men were merely a genetic experiment being run by women, <laughs> this is a theory that uh, I heard actually, along with Paul Davies actually in, in Windsor Castle last year, that, this is, the, the, the facts are that there's a strong selection that's made by females of any species to pick males that don't have too many mutations. Right? And in the case of primates, one thing that they can do that, you know, you, you know peacocks, the, the, the peahens look for all these big feathers, not because the feathers themselves are valuable, but the feathers indicate that that peacock has pretty good genes. And not only that, he's you know, attracted to predators and he's still walking around. I mean, if he's made it this far, he must be good, right? Uh, it's, it's like Clint Eastwood walks into some western town, you know, and the women all turn out. Why? Well, he's made it this far. He must be good genes. You know? So, and what he was suggesting, that this guy from New Mexico, Jeff Miller, was suggesting that indeed our brain is wired into about half the human genome. See, so if your genes are a little bit messed up, then your brain is not wired up terribly well. And so that what women are doing is they're trying to evaluate your genes by using an indicator, in this case the brain, and so how do the men display the indicator? Well, you could go around to cocktail parties and take out your brain, pass it around to the women. Turns out, that's a social blunder. But what you can do, <laughs> I mean, I've tried it, but, it, but if, 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 if the men are, you know, can have a good line of patter or they're witty or they can sing or something like that, that shows that their brains are wired up right. Not that the women care about that, but they do care about the fact that the, gen the, the, the genome is good. So this is a very common mechanism, this is a mechanism that would apply over many species. Very long answer. It seems that intelligence may not be rare, but we don't really know the answer to your question until we find other intelligence. Okay, we have some questions from the audience. This lady here, please. Seth, thank you so much for your talk and particularly your humor. You realize that is one of the alien characteristics, of course. They all have a wonderful sense of humor. Yeah, don't they? <laughs> Have you done any research on the dog star Sirius? Uh, no, not, no, personally I haven't. Sirius is a, I mean, you know, it's a well-studied star because it's, 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 it's nearby, it's, you know, apparently very bright, and in fact intrinsically rather bright. It's, an, it's what's called an early type star, which is to say it's considerably hotter than the sun. It's probably not a very good one for life, I have to tell you, because the, these bigger stars don't last very long. You, you want to start the, the, the brightest stars. Most of the stars you see with your naked eye, by the way, I might mention to the, this to you. Most of the stars you, you know by name, Betelgeuse, you know, all these things that have names, these Arabic names, nice, very attractive Arabic names, actually. That those are all giant stars, most of them. They're giant stars. And giant stars go through their fuel very quickly, and they burn out in a few tens of millions of years, and they blow up, which, you know, can ruin your whole day if you're on a planet run. The, the, the point is that these stars are usually not very suitable for any sort of biology, let alone intelligence. That wasn't the answer you wanted. <laughs> no, I'll ask you to rethink it. And perhaps you'll have your answer in a couple of years. We actually do look at all nearby stars within 50 light years. So Sirius, I'm not sure what the distance is. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. The lights are a bit bright, so I can't tell if there's anyone in the gallery there. Can you wave if you're there? No? Okay, we'll move down to the next, next uh, questioner down here then. Uh, good afternoon. I'd just like your thoughts on the mounting a number of pilots that have sightings. 
of anomalous blips on the radar. Yeah, well, it's quite true that there, there are roughly 10... Everybody heard the question, I think. Um, there are on the order of 10,000 reported UFO sightings every year. That, that number has not abated. And uh, many of them are from pilots. In fact, there's somebody at this conference who was a pilot who was telling me about something that they had seen. Uh, all I can tell you is this. Uh, it isn't that people question whether these people have seen something. That isn't the issue. The question, of course, is what have they seen, right? And pilots are, you know, they're, they're familiar with the sorts of things they see every day, but unusual things like incoming meteors, they're not so familiar with. So you know, they, they could get confused. What has happened in, the, in, in terms of the UFO phenomenon, just very, very briefly, it, it began for real in the late 1940s, as you know, okay? And keep in mind that after the war, suddenly there were a lot more things in the sky to be seen. <laughs> Something to, to, to keep in mind. But in any case, there were these reports of UFOs, uh, that, that term was coined very early, and the U.S. Air Force and other organizations, but in particular the U.S. Air Force became interested in it. And they were interested in the phenomenon, not, I don't think, because they expected that these were little alien guys sailing through the skies, but they were concerned that there were Soviet aircraft that they didn't know about, and they wanted to know what these things were. So what they would bring to do, do is bring together you know, teams of academics, and they'd say, you know, figure out what this stuff is. And the academics would say, bring us the 100 best cases which they did, and this, this happened three times at least, and it turned out that they could explain 90% of those cases as very prosaic phenomena, you know, aircraft, balloons, shrimp boats, uh, fishing boats in the, Jap in the Sea of Japan, and, uh, you know, stars, bright stars, planets, there's a whole laundry list of stuff. And there were about 10% of them that they couldn't explain. And that's it. That's the bottom line. Now, you could say, well, all right, those 10% include the, the alien craft which are never seen by satellites overhead, right? never seen by NORAD radar looking up, never land. It's as if the, the Spaniards had come to the Americas and sailed off the coast for 50 years teasing the Indians, right? but never landing. It doesn't make any sense. But, okay, so you have that 10%, 10 are unexplained. And what does that mean? I would only suggest you just consider this. The Adelaide Police Department may solve 80% of the murders here. I don't know, but probably. Okay. And all the 80% of those murders are committed by humans against other humans. But what about the 20% they didn't solve? <laughs> Could those be aliens murdering Adelaideans? Could be. <laughs> but you've got to say that's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> okay, okay uh, we have three more questioners here and we have three minutes there. Okay, so I'll be, I'll be brief. I'm sure these guys will be good and be brief, but <laughs> we'll, I'll ask you to be brief. Uh, Next one, please. Quick question. Um, I'm one of the people who runs the SETI screensaver. How much difference do all these guys running the screens and, and girls running these screensavers make? Is yeah. that a big contribution to your computing power? Four and a half million people have downloaded that screensaver. It's not our project. It's a okay. project of the University of California Berkeley SETI project. Yeah. And those data that are being processed by that screensaver are the most intensely looked at SETI data in the world for sure. It's unfortunately not particularly sensitive data that you're working on. But it could be that you will be the lucky one. All I would say is don't book your flight to Stockholm just yet. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. Uh, yes, um, Arthur C. Clarke said once upon a time that um, the more advanced a race becomes, the more spiritually advanced the race becomes and the less warlike. Uh, I'm not sure that that really works because the law of nature is, you know, you kill or be killed. What's your opinion on that? Well, you're asking alien sociology, and I have to, <laughs> I have to tell you the data on alien sociology are rather sparse. <laughs> so, of course, we don't know. I mean, if this scenario I just painted here to be provocative has any merit, that, that really the intelligence, the dominant intelligence of the galaxy is not biological intelligence at all, then it has completely different motives. What is it, what's the interest of a, of a big machine that keeps getting smarter all the time? What does it do to keep itself interested in things? And, and that's, you know, I, I have no idea. I, all I would say is this. Uh, I don't know whether the advanced aliens are Pacific or not. If they were to come here, I personally would grab a woman ahead for the hills because <laughs> it's been the experience, at least here on Earth, that the ones that travel to where you are are not the nice ones. <laughs> Someplace. Over about the last, well, probably 70, 80 years, we've been spraying radio waves throughout the universe. As we become more advanced, we become more efficient. It seems to me that by the time we are perhaps at the stage we're hoping the aliens would be, that they would be very, very efficient with their 
radio communications or whatever communications they have and not be spraying it around the universe. And therefore I'm asking you, is the radio waves that you're looking for the ideal way to look? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. And that's a very good point. It is true that, you know, in another 20 years, you won't get your television signals from, you know, big red and white antennas on the hills outside of town spewing, as you say, signals into space in a very inefficient way. Everything will come into your house via a fiber optic cable or something like that. And uh, consequently, Earth will look very quiet from space. Uh, and presumably the aliens have already done that. But there's always need for some powerful transmitters. You, you need radars to look for incoming long period comets, which otherwise could you know, wreak havoc and destruction. You might have colonies nearby that you have to have telecommunications with. It's very, I would say, let me just put it this way. Uh, speculation here is fun, but probably not terribly profitable. If you asked Marconi 100 years ago, hey, Gigliani, or whatever his name was, now what do you think your invention is going to be used for in the year 2003? He probably would have had some ideas, all of which would have been wrong. So. Uh, the, the, the bottom line is that radio turns out to be the cheapest way per bit of sending information from star to star in terms of the energy cost. And that will always be true. That's physics. So the rest is technology. Thank okay. you very much. We're going to have to wrap up the questions there, but one last question from the Premier of South Australia, Mike Rand. Um, I ought to explain this to the audience. Uh, Seth and I were at a function a couple of nights ago where Mike Rand was present, and Mike had a question for Seth. Um, so let's hear what your Premier had to say. Well, uh, I want to hear could the you, question. Could you repeat the oh. question? The question <laughs> wanted to know why they always came here to do anal probes. <laughs> <laughs> He's your Premier. <laughs> I... Um, I tried to, in my answer not to make any buts about my response, but what I said was, <laughs> what I said, uh, I, I, I said, well, if you look at the motives that are ascribed to visiting aliens, invading aliens, usually in fiction, particularly in the movies and on TV, what do they come to Earth for? There are only a few things. They come here either to trash the planet and take it over, they're here for the real estate or our resources, they want the water or something, or they're here to abduct you for experiments mom wouldn't approve of. Right. And that wouldn't work anyhow. <laughs> I mean, aside from matters of consent and fit, they're not going to work. But those are exactly the motives that we would have ascribed to some tribe on the other side of a hill 50,000 years ago. Those are the sorts of motives we ascribe to our competitors, that they will take our resources, take our land, whatever, our crops, or they'll take our women. Okay. And uh, so it doesn't surprise me that that's why the Premier is worried about anal probes. <laughs> uh, just before you leave, one quick announcement. Seth is going to be available in the tent just outside to sign books, so if you'd like to meet him there, he'll be there in about five minutes. Please give him another big hand.